Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 SGA annual meeting. So excited to see all of y'all here. Uh, to kick things off, let me do a few reminders. Per the SGA COVID-19 guidelines that are on our website under the annual meeting webpage, we are requiring masks. So please, when you're done eating, um, place your mask back on. I've removed my mask to be able to talk to y'all just so that I can enunciate clearly because I am a poor enunciator to begin with. So uh, a mask does not help with that situation. Um, other announcements, very important to note, we have our vendors upstairs here in the, um, whatever whatever place this is location i don't even know what building we are in y'all like that's my where my brain's at this morning morgan center the morgan center our lovely vendors are upstairs please go visit them um, in break times whenever um, you have a chance uh we're so grateful for them to come here to jekyll and share their knowledge and expertise with us um also we have raffles upstairs so um also take that in mind as a nice bid to uh to go upstairs here uh, so uh, kicking things off, this year has been a hallmark in that we are back in person after two years of virtual annual meetings. But also this is our first hybrid meeting, which you've already experienced, comes with its whole slew of lovely surprises and, and twists and turns. Um, but it means that we get to share some of this meeting live with our virtual attendees who I actually don't even know that I'm on camera for at the moment, but hopefully I am. Um, and for those meeting sessions not being streamed live, they will be shared shortly after we wrap our meeting, allowing for processing time of the recording files by our program and local arrangement committee folks. Uh, to everyone in attendance, both in person and virtual, <laughs> another note, please bear with us as we navigate the ins and outs of this, our very first hybrid meeting. As I noted in the program booklet, this meeting is an experiment, and as any scientist can attest to, you don't always know what an experiment's results will be. Uh, I'm Kathy Miller, currently the digitization project manager at the Atlanta University Center Robert W. Woodruff Library, but speaking to you here today in the capacity of the being the 2022 president for the Society of Georgia Archivists. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with all of you, both in person and virtually, to kick off our annual meeting, whose theme revolves around the idea of sustaining. And I view that as not only sustaining our work, but how we have been able to sustain ourselves as human beings during these tough years of the pandemic. For those of us gathered here in Jekyll Island, let us acknowledge that this land, um, let us acknowledge this land as the homeland of the following Native American tribes, the Timuqua, Muscogee, Gual, and Yamasee. For our virtual attendees who may be joining us from across the state of Georgia, it is important to acknowledge the state's land as the homeland of the four aforementioned tribes, as well as the Westo, Appalachie, and Cherokee, members of the Creek Nation, Hichichi, Mikosuki, and Oconee, and one tribe lumped in for federal recognition, but is not that is not historically part of the Creek Nation, the Yuchi. These native people were made promises and treaties still unrealized today, coerced into signing away rights and land and forcibly removed from their lands. I challenge each of us to learn more about these people and their contributions to this place, to consider our institution's relationships to past and current mistreatment or apathy in regards to Native American lives and culture, and to support organizations that are working toward restorative actions. We're a bit pressed for time, especially due to the technical difficulties we just suffered from. So to be respectful of our keynote speaker's time for remarks, I'm going to launch right into my introduction of her. Katrina Davis Kendrick earned her M MSLS from the historic Clark Atlanta University School of Library and Information Studies. While known for her work on ethics, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and communities of practice in libraries, Kendrick's research on low morale experiences in library and archives workplaces is recognized as groundbreaking and validating for library employees at all levels. In her daily and long-term work, Kendrick has transformed library programs, services, and culture via creativity, leadership, and advocacy. She is committed to centering well-being, creativity, and empathy in the workplace, and promoting career clarity and rejuvenation to workers. In 2019, Kendrick was named the Association of College and Research Libraries Academic Research Librarian of the Year. 
I want to thank Katrina for being with us this morning and welcome her to kick off this year's annual meeting. Thank you so much, Kathy. Hello, everyone. It's good morning, everyone. I'm so honored to be here. Um, I've, I've always wanted to go to Jekyll Island and I, I finally had my opportunity and a little bit of life got in the way, but I'm really happy to be joining you through this medium of technology as it is and talking with you today about self-preservation in your workplace. And um, so we'll get started. We are pressed for time, but and we have a lot of content that I'd like to share with you. So we'll move through it as quickly as possible so I can get to your questions. So in front of you, you see my mission, which is to inspire authentic collegiality and to promote well-being, share the gifts of creativity, and cultivate empathetic, engaged leadership in the workplace. And I can't see the group. However, I'll um, if there's someone who can mediate for me, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand a little, um, in the next few minutes. And I'm going to be asking for a lot of feedback, actually, from you. Um, how many of you have trouble saying no? I hope I can. Yeah, okay, so I see some hands. Thanks, everybody, for your vulnerability. I appreciate that. Um, how many of you have a, sometimes when you say yes, you get in trouble because you really want to do the thing, but then you realize you don't have time to do it? Thank you. My mission helps me with that. <laughs> so I encourage you to consider that to create a mission statement that will help you navigate the difficulties that keep you from saying no as often as we should. And I want to repeat that as often as we should. We should be saying no more often so we can focus on the things that really bring us joy um, and I'm so glad I said yes to this um, conversation with you this morning because these are the conversations that bring me joy, even though the content may be not so fun. So I encourage you to think about your mission statement. So today I'm going to review the contemporary landscape of archive, the archives workforce. I'm going to review my morale research up until this point, and then we'll explore the role of LIS culture. And since we're on the same page, for me, I consider archives a part of LIS. So I, I recognize that it says libraries, and in my mind, it's libraries and archives. I also may use the term GLAM, which stands for galleries, libraries, um, archives, and museums, too. I also reveal established and emerging countermeasures to low morale, and I hope I'll be able to answer your questions. I do take questions throughout conversation, so we don't have to wait to the end. I recognize that may slow us up. We can decide, but I do answer questions. I don't have to wait to the end. And the last thing I ask you, for, for, I mentioned that I'll be asking for some feedback from you. So if you have a mobile device that reads QR codes, I'll give you a few minutes to pull those out because I have some questions for you. And they start now. So let's get started. A few questions for you. You have a QR code. And if you happen to be um, using a larger mobile device, the URL, the short URL is right below that code. So my first question is, what is your general employment status? OK. And I'll share with you results in a few minutes. OK. So go ahead and answer that first question. I'll leave this up for like five more seconds, that QR code. My next question is, if you work full time, in which range does your salary fall? Get that up for five more seconds. The next question is, do you plan to stay in the archives profession? Leave that up for a few more seconds. And the last one is, if you plan to leave and not because you're retiring, what's the most likely cause outside of retirement? And if you're not planning to leave, you can skip this question. All 
All right, so I'm gonna stop share here in the next few seconds so we can see some results, okay? All right, I hope everyone's seeing these results. Most of us are full-time. Forgive me as I go through the clunkiness of uh, the internet. For those of us who work full time, most of us are at the 40 to 79 range. Okay. Most of us plan to stay in the archives profession, but some of us are thinking there are definitely a contingent here that's thinking, mm, I don't know, maybe. And then the last one, for those of the, us who are thinking about leaving, hmm, okay, so no one answered that. All right, interesting. Thank you all so much for this feedback. I'm gonna go back to my presentation. So I asked these questions, they come directly from the SNR, the Ithaca SNR report, the A Census 2 report that was done earlier this year. About uh, 5,600 people, almost 5,700 people took this survey. Are y'all familiar with this survey? Okay. So this survey covers information about compensation in archives, job roles and duties, and educational attainment of people working in archives. This also covers larger industry sector information, what types of organizations um, folks are working in, um, relationships and types of um, collaborations they have, so on and so forth. It also covers information about job stability, even up the student loan debt, um, equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility conversations, and the, how we're doing with employee and industry retention and rec recruitment and retention. Okay, so I'm and they ask these questions. So let's go over some broad results of this report, this A census report. Job stability 81% of the group said that they're employed, employed full time and permanent. That seems to mirror the folks that chose to join the survey. The majority of the people in the room in the group seem to fall in this trend. Also, however, when I was looking at the document, these are the things that are concerning to me when I consider morale. 9% of people are employed part-time, 2% are unemployed and seeking full-time work. 1% is unemployed and seeking part-time work. 12% are on short, medium, or long-term contracts. And 33% are working part-time and have two or more part-time positions. And 34% of those only working part-time are wanting to work full-time. So job precarity is increasing in our library and archive spaces. Um, and I also have heard anecdotally on social media about folks working up to three part-time jobs to um, gain a sense of feeling like they can um, bring in one full-time uh, salary. When we look at that salary and return on investment in that salary, in the report, it says that 61% are earning between forty and seventy-nine thousand dollars a year. Again, this group seems to follow along that trend. However, when we look more closely in that account, in that report, ten percent make less than forty thousand annually. The median salary is fifty k, and I think the last time I looked at the op occupational outlook, outlook handbook, the median pay broadly is around sixty, uh, over sixty thousand dollars. OK, so the median salary for the group when they report out is a little bit lower than what the Federal the, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics shares. Part time worker ways are 
have huge disparities depending on what area of the country you work in. And also this report showed that people who earn the MLIS or the MLS degree are most likely to graduate with student debt. And in fact, 39% of that group who said they had student debt um, worth over at least $30,000 in student debt. I went to a private school. Clark Atlanta at the time when I went to school was private and it took me quite some time to pay off my student loans. When we look at equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility, progress is being made in representation and structural dismantling of the barriers that traditionally stop us from fully realizing equity, diversity, and inclusion and accessibility. However, the report also showed that there were, that people still feel excluded of diverse communities. Um, a very small, a few less people said that um, there was adequate addressing of equity, diversity, and inclusion and accessibility issues in archives. Um, people were less likely to agree that there was equitable distribution of promotion and recognition in archives. Um, it was a very low number, only 17% feel like they were clear anti-racism racism initiatives in archives workplaces. There is a disparity between Caucasian workers and Black, Indigenous, and people of color when it comes to perceptions of inclusion in archives. And there are continuing gaps in feelings of welcome for people who have different abilities um, and for people who, 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 are, who identify as LGBTQ. So um, these are some things that are concerning. When we look at employee mobility and retention in this report, great, more women are moving into formal leadership positions and um, the majority don't plan to leave the industry in the next five years. However, for those who are eyeing the door, they mentioned that males are overrepresented in leadership roles, which speaks to mobility and moving into, into a career. And when we look outside of retirement, retirement was the number one reason folks are considering leaving. And the second likely reasons for leaving include burnouts, limited compensation, or going for better compensation elsewhere. And these were all tied at about 35% each for each um, of these indicators. A close third reason was lack of opportunity for career advancement and also of note as I consider my work is um, pursuing a new industry, work-life balance were tied, and quote, incompatibility with upper management. In my research, when I look at toxicity, this reminds me of a study done in 20. 2007, where folks were looking at toxicity in libraries, and the biggest indicator was permanent personality reasons. So for me, this sort of reason, the same area of in this general sense of not being compatible with coworkers. Um, and if there's any questions about this in the chat, go ahead and send them. And um, I love to hear if you have questions about these, but these are some things that I found really interesting looking at this A Census 2 report coming from Ithaca SNR. I encourage you to read the report if you can. These data are all helpful and useful and there's something missing. And what is that narrative and experience? So from here, I'd like to share with you my work in the low morale, my work about low morale in LIS workplaces. This is a statement from a special collections librarian who I spoke with when I was looking very closely at how people decide to leave libraries and archives who, do, who are dealing with low morale in their workplaces. This person mentioned, I'm not in a position where I can just pack up and move, you know, what seems to, and that seemed to be the case with a lot of librarians. Um, they realized that maybe they have to sort of move out of state to another institution to get away from their sort of negative experience, but I can't do that. I have older parents, so I'm not in a position to do that. I have student loan debt. So you can see in this one piece of narrative, a very specific piece, I can pull out a great deal of information that is both telling me what's going on in their current workplace and what is preventing them from leaving their workplace, but that they'd have a desire to leave. Okay. That is the power of narrative. So let's go through why am I doing this, Katrina? Well, I've been doing this work since 2016. I've been looking at, I started with academic libraries because that's where I live um, when I'm working in my formal work. And then I started saying, I need to talk to public libraries. And then I, and, um, but most pe people also include, um, when I talk to academic libraries, I also get special collections librarians and archivists. Um, and 96%, according to that A Census report, 96% of respondents are working in educational organizations um, and then are employed by colleges and universities. 
I've done five studies, four have been published and one is forthcoming. And they all cover work experiences of people working in libraries, employee behaviors in those organizations, organizational systems that impact what's happening to these employees, individual organizational and career practices and choices of people dealing with low morale, the health outcomes that they um, experience and how people choose to leave or figure out how to leave their abusive workplaces. All of these works come to one question. I've been following one question since 2016. What does it feel like? And more importantly, what does it mean to have low morale within the environmental and social context of librarianship? That's been my question. So this is what I've learned. And lots of the times when people now, even now with the pandemic, um, when we're hearing our colleagues and our administrators, um, people who run our colleges and universities, they say low morale, but this is not what they mean. They still mean the traditional sense of low morale. And both of these definitions are valid. And my goal is to make sure that we shift that conversation to this discrete understanding of low morale is just about pay, or it's just that my boss is mean, or it's just that I didn't, um, I I just didn't recognize that this wasn't a good fit. Those are discrete conversations about low morale and it, and it doesn't take into account what we now know. And now we're shifting to when people talk about low morale, they talk about exposure to a repeated and protracted exposure to workplace abuse and neglect, okay? That's what they're talking about. And there are several types of abuse that come up repetitively since I've done these studies. Um, and I'll go through them quickly emotional abuse, and I'll just leave those. Um, these behaviors that you see in Black, they're not limited to those, okay? Also, um, uh, these types of abuse and neglect don't happen. Um, they only, this person only did this type of abuse. They often happen in concert with each other and they're matrical. So emotional abuse, um, verbal and written abuse, this includes not speaking and or choosing not that, to write things down in order to circumvent systems, system abuse, and negligence. And everybody, when I talk with people about their experiences, they're very, very clear on emotional abuse, verbal and written abuse, and system abuse. Negligence is, they, they, people aren't aware of it. They feel like it's just a natural outcome of something else. But I want to share with you that negligence is a form of abuse. So even if you've never been emotionally abused or outright phys, uh, uh, verbally or uh, had written abuse or system abuse, also in public libraries, they announce physical abuse. Um, so physical abuse is also on hand here. And, it's, and it looks like it's increasing in academic libraries as well. But keep in mind that negligence is also a form of abuse. And negligence when I think about abuse and negligence, abuse is something active being bad done that is bad to something done bad to you. Negligence is nothing being done for you, particularly when you've said that something is happening to you. So it could be passive negligence. You're just being ignored and nothing's going on and you just exclude it, which is also a form of emotional abuse. So you see how these are matrical, but it's also when you say something and nothing is done. Okay, so I'll um, go through the, low morale experience trajectory, I encourage you to read that QR code to go through this in more detail a little bit and also read my work as well. But generally, low morale experiences start with a trigger event. Most people don't realize it was the trigger event unless I ask them. But every time you are asked, you will go back to the same event, even if other instances of and other abusers show up, you will always think, oh, it started here, if I think about it, it was this, and I should, and I maybe I should have known. You shouldn't have known. There was no way you could have known. But um, what really is the marker is the long-term exposure. So there's the trigger event, which you're like, did that just happen? And you might shake it off, and then something else will happen, and then another type of abuse will happen, and then this other thing will happen. Okay, so it's long-term. Um, and then after that, you'll start feeling intense or extended emotional, physical, and most importantly, cognitive responses. Cognitive responses are the marker of a low morale experience. Your thinking starts changing, your, your behavior starts changing um, because there's daily changes in practice and you start thinking, is this where I'm supposed to be? I, maybe I should have done something else. I didn't think it was going to be this way. Maybe I should leave. Maybe this is the wrong career. Um, I'm not, something is wrong. It's, and then people start thinking it must be me. It's not you. So then people start thinking about coping strategies. Coping strategies are negative and positive behaviors that 
help people feel better about what's happening to them in the moment, but they don't impact the abuser. Um, and they people start trying to attempt to resolve the experience. They start, maybe I need to look for another job. Um, maybe I need to report something to human resources. Those are called mitigation methods. Those are attempts that are deliberate that try to stop what's happening and impact the organization. Um, the most interesting way that people respond is, let's say your abuser taps you and says, give me a reference now. Okay, um, that's an that's a issue of self-awareness on the part of the abuser. But outside of that, let's say they ask you for a reference and you say, I'm going to give the best reference ever. So they'll get out of here. <laughs> that's called job ushering. And folks do that. And remember, when what happens is they're now free to wreak havoc on the new organization. So one of the questions that often comes to me is, um, Katrina, how is it that abusers just keep getting jobs? Perhaps job ushering is one of the ways. As they move through the experience and attempt to resolve the experience, they start recognizing these are long-term health impacts. If they go to another job, they're realizing that they may or may not realize it, but they definitely might be behaving as if they're still being abused or neglected from the other, um, the other job that they left. Um, and that's why I say that recovery is not guaranteed because there are long-term health impacts as well. So let's say you, a lot of people report um, high blood pressure. Um, if you have diabetes or some other chronic illness, just because you go to a new job doesn't mean that that goes away, even if it's less dysfunction there. So recovery is long term and it's usually the psychological impacts of the abuse and neglect that people have encountered. People also mentioned that they have learned lessons and people who move into leadership positions often seem more empathetic. And most people are more aware of when other people are being bothered and they reduce the bystanderism. I mentioned those impacts. Um, so there are other things that are playing, making a play when people are dealing with low morale. These are what I call impact factors. These are an enabling systems. And these are just a few. So people think that librarians and archivists are just so nice. And if you report that something's happening in the library, um, people have shared with me that they say, oh, y'all are so quiet, y'all. What are y'all doing? Throwing books at each other, ha, 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 ha. Or we're just seen as meek. Um, people who present as male are seen as uh, effeminate, and so they're not going to fight back. Um, so all of these perceptions and stereotypes about libraries impact how we might report out. There are also human resources limitations. You go to HR and they say, well, that's just how Morgan is. Uh, Morgan's been here for, for five years, so, or John has been here for 20 years. He's about to retire. You just hold on, you know, maybe we'll just wait it out, those sorts of things. If you are going for promotion and tenure, there's a power dynamic of a, of a of emotional intimidation that could be happening. Leadership styles also play a role here. Uh, if you're author authoritarian leadership, um, what I call ambivalent leadership, there might be a person who's never around, or I also call ambivalent leadership dude bro leadership. You know, it'll be fine. You tell the person something on, and they're like, dude, it'll be fine. Just, you know, y'all work it out. That's ambivalent leadership, working itself out. And then staffing and employment. We, we, we all know that the great resignation is happening. People are shuffling around. But even before that, we have struggled to staff our archives and libraries appropriately so we can do the work that we need done. There are additional um, enabling systems for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. You can see them all here. These are additional. They experience the ones on the left as well as the ones on the right. Right. If you have any questions about the ones on the right, let me know. I think the most telling one here for me is diversity rhetoric. We say we're doing things to increase diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and there's no benchmarking when they make when people tell their experiences, their tone policed, and things like that. And remember, this diversity rhetoric is happening while people are being abused and neglected in their workplaces. Okay. My current study on library leaders shares with me that leaders are also dealing with low morale. They also experience low morale. They're not only experiencing it as watching their team go through low morale, but they themselves are experiencing low morale. And this is an important study because the common conventional wisdom says that the abuse is happening from the administrators down. Well, that it, that's not necessarily the case. They have more new impact factors. We found that librarians, people think that library and archives leaders have a lot of power because they have a title. That is not the case. Um, if you are working as a dean or a director and you're between a provost and your department heads, 
who are you going to, are you going to go tell HR that the provost is abusing you? Probably not. So that's that positional isolation. Are you more likely to try to protect your, your department heads and your other team members? Yes, you are. You're going to tell them that. No, you're not. There's also something called legacy toxicity. And that is when a person comes into an organization and they realize that they may not be able to fix the low morale because of a couple of factors. Perhaps the previous incumbent was the abuser. Perhaps the previous incumbent had already started trying to work on things and has exhausted all possibilities. Or more likely, the people who are saying they want to change, who have been traumatized for whatever reason, are unconsciously or consciously stopping the leader from doing the work to fix low morale. And those are trauma responses. People who might be familiar with trauma know that people who have trauma find a lot of comfort in their trauma responses, either subconsciously or consciously. Um, and then the other one is accountability. It's very difficult for leaders to enact accountability due to these other factors and ongoing long-term systems that HR might have or the, the library it's, or archive itself may have that, that hamper the ability for us to be accountable and hold people accountable for their behaviors. Abuse and neglect is not exclusively top down. It is also perpetrated upon leaders by their own supervisors, even their organizational peer, like for instance, from a dean to another dean and direct and indirect reports. So it's coming this way, this way, and this way, okay? This is what the new um, data show me on this study. There are also frameworks. How many of you have heard of Fabazi Itar's vocational awe? And so I think I'm looking at the screen. But if you haven't, um, it's a wonderful concept discussing how we weaponize our own values against ourselves. And we define purity tests um, to say what, what, who, who is the real librarian. Um, we, we overwork because we feel like it's a calling. And so that means we don't have a lot of boundaries. And our identity is that we work, we are an archivist. And, and I am a, I am a, a daughter, um, a spouse, what have you know, all that comes second. I like crochet. That doesn't, that's net, that's later. First, I'm an archivist. First, I'm a librarian. And that is, that is difficulties for people when you're trying to create boundaries when we think about burnout. Okay. The other one is resilience narratives. How many of you have been told to do more with less in the last two years? And how about before that? How many of you have been told to just lean in? How many have you been told to just be resilient? How many of you have been asked, well, so-and-so -and -so archive or library is doing so-and-so, why aren't you doing that? Those are resilience narratives that make everything the same as if everything is the same for everybody. All things happen the same for everyone. It increases a scarcity mindset, it increases a sense of false competition um, and all these things. The next one is job precarity, which I've already mentioned. And then we're not only looking at burnout, but we're also looking at compassion fatigue. When we not only are burning out because we're trying to do all the things and get it all done, but we're also, especially during the pandemic, we, we have become increasingly concerned about the health and well-being of our library users. Um, and we might be overly concerned, overly thinking about how are they doing? What can I do to help? And when you get to that point, that is um, compassion fatigue. When you are living someone else's um, concerns vicariously and you can't separate from them. These are the impacts on employees who are dealing with low morale. These are just some of them, okay? Um, the isolation comes generally not only because they're being abused, perhaps their uh, abuser is isolating them on purpose if they're an authoritarian leader, but also they determine that they're going to withdraw and not hang out with other people. They don't want they, they don't want to be hanging out. So that one is a very concerning. The other one is uh, that is very concerning is decreased professional confidence. That's the thing that you take with you, even if you go to a new job. That's the thing that keeps you from applying for the jobs to try to get out, to, to try to leave your organ, the um, abusive place, okay? That's the thing that keeps you wondering after you go to your next job. You know, one person was saying, can I go to the restroom? They would ask their colleagues at the new place, is it okay if I go to the restroom? So those sorts of things. Um, so increased procrastination, decreased productivity, decreased willingness to collaborate, the desire to change careers and lead the profession. When we look at how this impacts our health, 
these are just some of the things that are most often reported to me. Okay, these are just some of the things. There are more things that are reported. These are the ones that come up over and over and over again that I'll um, share here. Um, and, and sleep quality includes sleep loss, sleeping too much, and fitful sleep. So never really be, being able to get deep sleep, which is the restful sleep one needs. And in mental health, um, anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder have all been either mentioned and also some people have diagnoses all the way up to a diagnosis of the PTSD. Um, one thing I will share with you here that some, at least once in every cohort, another, um, at least one person in every cohort that I've done an interview for has also um, mentioned um, wanting to unalive themselves. So when I think about that, um, that's very concerning because the one person that reports, I'm often wondering who didn't share that, who didn't share that. So these things are very, very serious and they run the gamut from anxiety all the way up to um, very, very deep feelings of helplessness. I wanna share with you some countermeasures recognizing that we have only a little bit of time here. My biggest countermeasure is self-preservation, self-preservation. Um, and these are the tools that are required for survival and deflection of acts of workplace abuse and neglect at the time the events occur. So these are practices. Um, and these are the things that as I talk with people, we recognize that these things didn't happen or they didn't think they were available to them when they, when they were first exposed to abuse or neglect. First, we need to curate hum humane communication, humane communication. Glam workers seem to have a trouble with assertive communication because our goal for service means we can't get anybody, usually means people please. In libraries and archives, assertive communication, there's no such thing as assertive communication. For us, we, we would rather have good communication and good means people feel good when about us personally, like they feel good about Katrina when they walked away. And as long as they think I'm nice, then that's better than whatever else is actually going on. It will be better for them to understand and have clear communication. One of my favorite quotes from Brene Brown is, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. And when we're really busy being nice, we're often being unclear. Because if I have to tell you that I need you to not eat pizza right by the archives, but instead, I'm like, you know, OK, well, you know, it's, I, I don't want to make them angry or well, that's the president. I don't want him to fire me. Well, I still need these archives, these, these documents and artifacts to be maintained. So I have to figure out a way for them to know very kindly and clearly that you're welcome here and you also cannot eat pizza right here. So one way you can do that is lead with what people can do. Hello. Welcome. Welcome in. Let me show you where you can eat X. And I'll have those items pulled for you and they'll be right here when you're complete with your meal. That's it. That's all we have to say. And that can be something you can say to a president or an undergraduate student or a five-year-old walking into your, your organization, right? The other one is mindful inquiry. This is a really great tool for, particularly for um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, and how to handle microaggressions. So what it does is it asks you to ask questions in response and not questions that give you labor but questions that make the other person think about what they're doing and so you get more information so you say you can say something oh can you share more with me about why you think that and wait and so you're holding space for people and you're not reacting it puts you in a place of proactivity and you can learn more about that um, in the uh, work site at there's also something that goes even more deeper and it's called intergroup dialogue. This is a larger place where you can get really great and deep training because it has us look at our identities, what identities we bring to an interaction and what identities might someone else be bringing to an interaction so we can have a conversation, a dialogue rather than a debate or a challenge, okay? So I would consider if you have entered, if you have a lot of, some organizations have trainings for intergroup dialogues in their organizations. So take a look at that. The other one is to curate engagement. When people are going through low morale, the first thing they do is withdraw. So they won't look for continuing education. They will stop joining organizations. So again, I'm really glad to see you all here today. People stop doing all the things that brought them joy. Think about a time when you felt sad or something was happening to you. 
Did you stop doing your crochet? Did you stop watching your favorite show? Did you stop running? Did you stop exercising? Did you, what, what are those hobbies that you had that brought you joy that now you do even less or have stopped? Creativity helps our minds rest and they bring us back to our full uh, identity. So curate engagement. And the other thing about continuing education is if you're trying to leave, continuing education and professional activity counters the reduced professional confidence and ensures that you have the skills to move forward to another organization. So if you're considering leaving, Continue your education and continue that professional activity. And if you can't do those things, at least on your in your organizations, if there are task force or groups in other areas of your organization, join them. So you will have, again, a counter narrative to what's going on in your immediate department or area. And the other last thing is rest, 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 rest. Rest can be getting your nails done. Rest can be shutting your eyes for 20 minutes. Rest can be staring into the middle distance for 10 minutes. Rest can be playing with your kids rest is rest is leisure it could be going for a walk rest is when your brain and body are doing something else so include leisure and rest and that's short for take your vacations every last one of them don't let your goal if you have a lot of overtime that you think you're going to lose or time that you think use your time use your time and then curate accountability this is most important Many folks share with me that they're not leaders, and so that means they can't do something. I am a fan of informal leadership. The, my current title, my formal title is the first formal leadership title I've had in my 20-year career, and I have perceived that I've always been a leader. Leaders do not have anything to do with titles, and there are a lot of people who have titles who cannot lead, so do not think that you cannot lead. You can lead right now. You can model behavior. You can reward other people for the behavior by saying, that was a great job. We need to do more of that. What can we do? Let's work together. You can model collective care and mutual aid. You can do more than just think that, oh, someone else can do it. You can ask after people. You can offer people help. You can say, oh, I can't help you, but someone else can. There are people you know who can help people that you know who are suffering. Help them make those connections because that's how you show empathy, true empathy. I see someone is, needs help, and if I can't help them, I'm going to still ask after and see what they need. Um, and you can also invoke moral courage. One of the things that um, uh, often a question that might be going through someone's mind and has been asked to me is, Katrina, something might happen to me if I say something. And my answer is, if you're dealing with low morale, something is already happening to you. So you may as well speak up. And Audrey Lord said it best, your silence will not protect you because you've been silent all this time. So you may as well do something different. And most of all, show self-compassion. All of these are practices. Practices you get better. Exercise all of those things in the order or, or methodology that seems best for you. And you're going to flub. You're going to give that abuser the first time. You're going to say, I should have said something. I, I didn't say something. I'll say, I know what I'm going to say next time. I know what I'm going to say next time. Be compassionate towards yourself. If you've gone through this experience, do not blame yourself. There's no way you could have seen it coming. If you are in this situation right now, have self-compassion as you figure out your pathway forward. And if you have gotten out of this situation, when you go back to those memories, speak to yourself kindly. Negative self-talk is, um, is the number one thing that um, causes that reduced self-confidence. It's not what other people, it's not only what the other behaviors that might be happening to you, it's how you begin talking to yourself. So I have one last question for you, everybody. And it's on this QR code. If you have faced low morale, choose about three self-preservation tools that you're most likely to try or expand. Now I'll leave that up. And that's the end of my formal presentation. I'm happy to take questions. I, went, I, I think I went pretty quickly. I wanted to make sure that you have time to get back on track for your sessions today. And I'm looking at chat as well.
Thank you. So I'm doing ongoing data collection. You can also look at this QR code. These are the things I'm always taking, like constantly taking data for. So you're welcome to get to those. Thank you so much. We have a mic here we can pass around Katrina can you hear this can you hear me I can okay great does anyone in here have any questions I can pass the mic to you while we're waiting there one person says sad that work can be so awful that we have to develop preservation strategies to cope my immediate um response to that is I'm never happy that to talk about low morale however I'm happy to be surfacing that it's happening in our organizations because silence means that the abuse can continue and the other thing I think of it is is even if we didn't find out know about the abuse or think about it I think that for Bozzi's work on vocational all shows that Sometimes it's not whether abuse is happening or not, because we take on a lot of these things on our own. And so I believe that self-preservation strategies are also excellent to enact, even if there's no dysfunction in your organization. Are there questions from the floor? Um, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, do you have a sense of if these issues are worse in our industry or if they're standard? I, I'm very curious about how widespread outside of archives this is. Outside of archives or inside of archives? Well, both. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if it's what's unique to our industry um, and I, I don't know. So as a way to kind of wrap my head around it to understand kind of where us specifically fit in this and or if it's a wider societal thing. I think that it is happening in all do what do number one, I don't think that work, workplace abuse and neglect is is unique to libraries. I think I'm the only one who has realized that. So when I started the study. My question was, if you think that you've gone through low morale, this is what the literature says. The literature says it's about pay, compensation, maybe you have a quote unquote bad boss. If these any of these things you think match you, let me know. And so when I did the study, I was thinking, okay, according to this definition in the current literature currently as of 2016, low morale means that I'm gonna hear stories from librarians about, academic librarians at that point, about how the teaching faculty treat me. That's the worst I thought I would hear. The first, uh, the first person I talked to, I thought it was an outlier. But everyone did not talk about teaching faculty. Talk about how library, what library, library workers were doing to each other. Um, that being said, I don't. I've talked with people outside of libraries and archives, and when they talk, hear my work, they're like, "That happens to me." I have attempted to get more. Um, data from people working in business and nonprofits is difficult for me to reach them at this time. Um, I'll probably, I, start, I tried in 2018, I'll likely try again next year. Um, I don't have a lot of data specifically to archives. The reason, um, but when I open up to libraries and archives, I get what I get. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that as I continue this work, I'm, look, I'm gonna be looking more at archives, I'm also probably going to look at medical libraries, like very specialized libraries like that, to get a better gauge on that other part of your question. Right now, if you work in an academic library, what I'm hearing is they have the similar. If you are archivist working at an academic library, you're likely dealing with the similar trajectory of low morale because you're dealing with the same things, the same folks, similar systems. Any other questions? Katrina. Hello, um, how are you? Hello, I'm Christina. I don't really have a question, but all I wanted to say was your presentation was awesome. And it really made me want to get up and preach <laughs> because I've been in this profession for 20 years. I worked in nonprofits, special libraries and academic libraries. And I think everything that you brought up in this presentation, I've experienced in some way, shape or form in my 20 years. Um, and I have like so many stories, but it just like brought back a lot for me. 
But um, in what your presentation showed me too, as now me as a, a boss and a supervisor, I mean, that's one thing that all that trauma that I got as a, you know, before I became a professional archivist and everything, I was like, I am not going to I'm not going to give this trauma <laughs> to my people. So I try my best. Um, I can't say that there aren't things that happen, but now as a supervisor, I also feel that push and pull in the middle, you know, between the dean and my employees. So yeah, I, I think every single thing that you brought up, I, I can totally relate to. So thank you. Wow, thank you so much. And this is what I have been trying, I'm working, one of the reasons I did the leadership study is because, well, now I'm a formal leader and I start saying, hmm, I wonder what's happening with us, us. Um, and I think that the thing that, that is really helpful for you sharing that, thank you so much. First of all, I should say this, sorry you're dealing, you dealt. Thank you for being aware of your dealings. And also thank you for being aware of how you can work to not pass those dealings to your colleagues. And it's going to be hard. And so one thing I can share for leaders in the group right now, what is your shadow leadership style? Everybody here is thinking about their leadership style. And I guarantee none of you are saying, I'm an authoritarian leader. Woo, that's me. No one does. No one says they're totalitarian. However, we know that people who are dealing with low morale are being exposed to these behaviors, these types of leaders. So what is your sh shadow leadership style? Is your collaborative style when you're thinking, hey, I want to be in on, I'm just hanging out and helping you out. Are you being seen as a micromanager? If you're a perfectionist, how might that cause micromanagement that you don't mean to do? I am a perfectionist. And so one of the things I am really working on is this. And also trying to figure out what is it in my past life as a librarian that makes me like, I got to get ready. Well, I already know what it is. I was working at a rural library for seven years. It was just me and one other librarian. And if things didn't quote unquote get done, there was nobody, we had no library director, okay? So I felt like we got to get everything done because there's nobody here to lead us and so-and-so and other things are happening with the Dean. They're not paying attention. So I have to do everything. So now as a new leader, after seven years of running amok, I have to learn that I have 18 other people and I can do this and it's hard. So what is your shadow leadership style? Leaders. So we have time for one last question. And I think that question is gonna come from the chat. Um, okay. Is what are some ways organizations support self-preservation? It seems like self-preservation thinking and doing can put you at risk for isolation or how do you respond to that concern? Thank you. I don't think it puts you at um, isolation because part of the self-preservation key is talking with others. So we mentioned professional activity, professional engagement, continuing education. We mentioned how to speak to people more clearly. Um, and I think one of the keys is that more courage means that we're going to have to learn as, a, as an industry that assertive communication is not aggressive communication. Right now, assertive communication in libraries means that you're mean or you're not nice. And you know, the word nice covers a lot of atrocity. And I'd much rather be kind than seen as nice, even if folk just say I'm mean. But then if they start thinking about it, well, Katrina was there when, and Katrina did this, and Katrina advocated for, and such and such and such and so. So I don't think it puts me in a state of, I don't think it, put, can't, it puts you in a state of isolation if you don't have any flexibility with the with the with the measures and and that's where that self-compassion comes in um so how do organizations support it i don't know that organizations necessarily thrive to support self-preservation but institutions are designed to continue themselves and so but people change organizations so if you want your organization to support self-preservation it's not going to happen unless people start doing it that i mean that's kind of where we are and I think we can do it. People need to be aware of it. And that's when I talk about modeling behaviors and holding people accountable for their behaviors in a moment when you see someone say something nasty or mean or have a microaggression and you say, that's not how we talk here. Could you share with me a little bit more why, why you have that thought? So it actually encourages conversation. It, what it is doing though is encouraging conversations that we are not, we have not traditionally been comfortable having. 
thank you so much. Yeah, Katrina, this is Kathy. Uh, thank you so much. This officially wraps up our keynote address. Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and knowledge today and sharing all of these thoughts. I, uh, I learned a lot. Um, it was a bit triggering for me about a past traumatic job experience I had, but triggering in a good way of like, oh, I've moved past that. This is good. Um, so thank you again and uh, for sharing all of your resources with us as well. And uh, everyone go forth and enjoy the 2022 annual meeting. Have a wonderful conference, everyone. Please get in touch if you have questions. Y'all take care.